Good afternoon and welcome to our virtual briefing hosted by the European Study Center at the University of Pittsburgh and the German American Chamber of Commerce and Euroforum. This event has been co-sponsored by the University Center for International Studies and the International Business Center at the Katz School of Business at the University of Pittsburgh with cooperation from the Pittsburgh Glasgow Project and the Consumer <laughs> Health Coalition. The virtual briefing series is funded in part by a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence grant from the European Union. My name is Alison Delnor. I'm the Associate Director of the European Study Center at the University of Pittsburgh. And it's my pleasure to welcome our moderator and panelist today. Before I do though, I want to give a special thanks to Rachel Maurer of the Pittsburgh chapter of the German American Chamber of Commerce and to Shannon Hughes um, for their help in setting this event up. And of course, to the panelists and our moderator. We're pleased to welcome a number of participants, both online and in person, at one of our two venues in Pittsburgh, here downtown at um, Cohen and Grootsby's offices, and in Oakland, wave Oakland, um, at the University of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. University Center for International Studies. We're also pleased to welcome our panelists, both here and in Glasgow, Scotland, joining remotely as our many audience members. A special thanks to Iris Matijevic and Liz Shellen, and to our director, JJ Spoon, back in Oakland, for keeping this virtual bridge going. <clears throat> well, I'm going to let our moderator introduce the broader topic and of this conversation, which is this Pittsburgh-Glasgow project relationship. Um, but first, I want to introduce our panelists briefly. Um, joining us from Scotland is Des McNulty. Desmond McNulty is Assistant Vice Principal for Economic Development and Civic Engagement at the University of Glasgow and also Deputy Director of Policy Scotland. Des was appointed in 2016 as Vice Chair of the Glasgow Commission on Economic Growth, which provides strategic advice on economic development to eight local authorities in the Glasgow City re Region City Deal. He's written extensively about social inclusion, resilience, public service reform, poverty and inequality. And he's particularly interested in the use of big data for civic um, innovation. Between 1999 and 2011, Des was an elected member of the Scottish Parliament and served in a number of roles, including as Minister for Communities and Social Justice and as opposition spokesperson on education and transport. For five years, he was chair of the Parliament's Influential Finance Committee before entering the Scottish Parliament in 1999. He held senior positions as an elected member of Glasgow City and Strathclyde Regional Councils. Thanks for joining us, Des. Very welcome. <laughs> joining us here in the Cohen and Grigsby Conference Room, we have um, Grant Irvin, who's the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Pittsburgh. As the CRO, Mr. Irvin oversees the integration of sustainability and resilience into city services, programs, and policy. He's helped lead the development of a variety of programs, including Pittsburgh's inclusion in the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, the creation of the Uptown Eco Innovation District, District Energy Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and Neighborhood Community Information System, and the Pennsylvania Community Transportation Initiative. Prior to joining the city of Pittsburgh, Grant served as the regional director for 10,000 Friends of Pennsylvania, a statewide smart growth and sustainable development policy organization, and as public policy manager for Pittsburgh Community Reinvestment Group. We also have joining us Lee Holler, who's the director of innovation and performance at the city of Pittsburgh and the former deputy director of public works for the city of Pittsburgh during which time he, held, he led high-tech initiatives, including Pittsburgh's online snowplow tracker. Very useful. <laughs> Before joining the city's public works department in 2014, Holler worked in the private sector for cloud-based software company SciQuest and supply chain firm CombineNet, where he focused on systems implementation, process improvement, and project management. In his current role, Mr. Holler oversees such initiatives as the Pittsburgh Roadmap for Inclusive in innovation and Pittsburgh startup inc incubator PH, PGH Lab and MetroLab, which encourages city university partnerships and has fostered research cooperation among the city of Pittsburgh, CMU, and the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you both for joining us. Finally, I want to welcome our moderator, 
Um, Dr. Kenneth Thompson is a Pittsburgh-based psychiatrist, former president of the Pittsburgh Psychiatric Society, and a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. Previously, Dr. Thompson served as associate director of medical affairs for the Center of Mental Health Services at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and associate professor of psychiatry and public health at the University of Pittsburgh and Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. He currently serves as a principal for Visible Hands Consulting in Pittsburgh. A native of Pittsburgh who has worked most of his career in the city, Dr. Thompson is also one of the co-PIs um, for the Pittsburgh Glasgow Project, funded by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation. So I, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Ken, who you, will Allison. introduce more about the topic. Thank you, Allison. Um, and uh, what a special treat to be able to be here today with, uh, with my panelists and with you, Allison, and, and you guys who have helped organize this. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, Des in Glasgow and some folks I can see in the uh, up at the main campus. Um, I, I'm going to just say a very few words about uh, the Pittsburgh Glasgow project and how it came to be. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, my panelists um, and I'm going to let them tell me which one wants to go first because I actually don't know <laughs> at the moment. We'll figure that out in a second. Um, uh, but but to start off, let me just say a word about this this project. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, some of you at the Center for International Studies at Pitt may may remember this. I don't know, um, but the roots of this project actually go way back to sometime around 2001, 2002, when um, I was um, at that time I was a Soros Physician Advocate Fellow, and I got to spend some time in in the UK, particularly in Glasgow. Uh, and I became aware of initiatives there that Des actually was involved with around um, healthy cities and other kinds of initiatives to address what was then a very large um, uh, and, and known uh, uh, problem of health inequity uh, with some neighborhoods and populations um, in this post-industrial city of Glasgow having significantly much shorter lifespans and much greater burdens of illness and disability. Um, and uh, around that time, Glasgow started to uh, uh, organize itself and created something called the Glasgow Center for Population Health. Um, we did some conferences here in Pittsburgh back then on health in post-industrial uh, cities and um, had folks from a variety of cities in the UK and in the US come together and meet. That, that work um, kind of went into um, uh, uh, somnolence for a little while. Um, I went off to work at the federal government and uh, left Pitt. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the uh, initiative that I was trying to pursue there was I uh, just couldn't pursue it any further. However, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, uh, Robert Wood Johnson came out with a, a grant um, to uh, learn from other countries. Basically, the title of the grant was uh, Global, uh, Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions, and they funded um, us and three other places, uh, three other entities, um, out of a total application pool of 400, we're told, um, to, uh, to spend time working with the city of Glasgow, resilient Glasgow, and the Glasgow Center for Population Health to learn what they had done in terms of their resilience strategy um, and how they had incorporated the, the pursuit of health equity as a fundamental goal of their city's development as a sustainable, um, uh, resilient place. Um, and people. And um, that, that project uh, has now been underway for almost a, a year and a half. We're actually coming to the end of our funding at the end of this year, but we are now looking for ways to sort of um, propose um, further work and further uh, kind of uh, conversation. Um, what I will say about the work that we have done with Glasgow is that it's become really, I think, clear, and I'll, I'll let uh, Grant and uh, Des maybe say some words about this. Um, and Lee, if, if this is in your, in your uh, bailiwick. Um, what's become clear is that it is uh, um, Im important for us to think about the city as a place where people live and make, th and make their living. And that is that context that produces health mm -hmm. and illness. And if we don't think about that and address the circumstances that allow people to thrive as human beings, um, we're going to have populations that are not healthy, uh, and we are going to have cities that are not resilient, and we will have um, uh, the opposite of obviously what we would love to see, which is people being able to thrive and be in cities that are vibrant. 
Um, and that's that's the uh, that's the gist of this. Our our work in Pittsburgh has been to try to figure out how to take what have been separate paths, sort of thinking about health on one path, thinking about resilience and and uh, community development on another path, and begin to figure out how these things merge and what that process is about. And I'm hopeful that some of that conversation will be reflected in what you hear from uh, panelists today, and um, and uh, we can get into it a little bit further. I, I think a key element of this, and I'm really thankful that the university is participating in this, and that both Pitt and Glasgow are uh, universities are engaged, because I think one of the key things is that in order for these kinds of conversations to happen um, and to move forward, it is truly helpful to have the involvement of uh, scholars who are engaged in thinking about different places in the process of translating place and people from one place to another. So I'm, I'm, I'm particularly glad that the universities have picked this up. I think it's somewhat fitting um, that this conversation goes on because uh, Hugh Henry Brackenridge, um, while he wasn't exactly from Glasgow, um, was uh, further down, the, as far as I can tell, he was from um, the Mall of Kintyre um, <laughs> and uh, Campbellton. I don't know if you knew that, Des. Um, so he's a he's a southwestern Scot. Um, that's where he was born. So uh, so of course we should have a relationship with um, Glasgow. Mm -hmm. By the way, I just want to point out that the University of Pennsylvania has a relationship with the University of Edinburgh. So uh, if we don't have a relationship with Glasgow, then what the hell are we doing? Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm I'm going to leave it at that and um, and say uh, you know which which I'm going to throw the ball up. Who wants to tip it first? I'll, 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 I'll lead off. Um, so thanks, Ken, and thanks, the University, and, and Lee and Des for joining the conversations. Ken, as you were talking, I was thinking of a million different directions in which I could take this. Um, but uh, the one thing that I would kind of start off with saying is that one of the, the key organizing principles for us at the City of Pittsburgh is that there are power in networks. Uh, and one of the things we did a, a back of the napkin analysis last summer that uh, with one of our interns that we found that we are the most networked per capita city in the United States um, in terms of the different groups that we are we are linking with um, in terms of municipal government. So whether that is, um, you know, through the Pittsburgh Glasgow project or our sister cities program or uh, Lee will talk about Metro Lab. Uh, the effect of pulling together networks of cities and partnerships in order to solve challenges and problems that the city is facing. Um, and that, that idea is that, you know, Pittsburgh being a city of 305,000 people in a region of 2.5 million, we're continually finding ways for us to punch above our weight. Um, so that, that kind of that ability for us to network uh, with other cities and share learnings is kind of the I'd say one of the underlying uh, principles that we have with the, the Pittsburgh Glasgow project. Uh, for me, the, the impetus of it was uh, having a conversation with Ken. Uh, we had recently been announced as one of the, the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities, and one of the first calls I got was from a psychiatrist. Uh, and I, I wondered if that was for me um, and kind of what we were getting into. Um, or if there was ulterior motives with that. Um, and it's been a little bit of both, I think, actually. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that uh, we started to make connections with in what is called uh, One PGH, which is the Pittsburgh's Resilient Strategy Process uh, that we've been engaged in over the past uh, two plus years, is a recognition of what the shocks and stressors that the city faces, shocks being a potential immediate negative impacts uh, like a hurricane or an earthquake or an, an economic collapse or stressors, kind of those long, slow moving uh, challenges that, that we all deal with each and every day, but we kind of endure through the work uh, and the lives that we have. And one of the things that we were, we were uh, able to do through Ken and other folks on our steering committee were to recognize that the connections that we have, particularly with stressors, are similar in other post-industrial cities, uh, specifically the work that Glasgow is doing um, with 100RC and really kind of before that, identifying the challenges of aging infrastructure and social and uh, gender and racial inequalities were, were very kind of uh, common threads that we were identifying uh, here within Pittsburgh. 
One of the separation points, however, was this idea of making that, that a stronger connection with regards to the impacts of health. Um, so the work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for us has been really fundamental um, in learning from Glasgow and, and kind of sharing kind of the, the different kind of aspects of our systems that we're engaged with, um, you know, in healthcare. The only difference, I think, between healthcare systems in some regards are, you know, they call theirs the NHS and we call ours UPMC or AHN. So, um, but both inherently have challenges in terms of the delivery of services, um, as well as different benefit structures. Um, you know, so working within kind of the, those systems, how do we, how do we share kind of the networks and learnings from that? But I think the other piece of this has been really the, the fundamental human connections that we've been able to make uh, with folks like Des and, uh, and his colleagues uh, with Glasgow City Council and uh, the Glasgow Center for Population and Health, uh, where you know, we've, we've made kind of that, that human kinship in terms of the, the shared benefit and the shared challenge that we're all in the same boat together, uh, trying to row in the same direction in terms of making stronger, healthier places for our, for our residents. Um, so that ability uh, for us to kind of accelerate learning and the application of what we're learning uh, is one of those things that we see moving forward. Uh, just a final thought maybe before I pass it off to Lee is the other kind of component of this has been um, the, the spark that the Pittsburgh Glasgow project uh, has ignited is one that is going to go and I'm making a call here, going to go beyond our two cities. And that is that we have found a lot of shared opportunity between other uh, post-industrial cities, or we call it post-industrial pre-something cities, um, that we've all been through this economic challenge. We've learned uh, from what it means to lose a, a major industry, whether it be shipbuilding or steel, but we've come out the other end uh, being a, a more environmentally, more sustainable place. But we see challenges up ahead on the horizon in terms of growing uh, inequality, in terms of um, the application of technology and how that impacts the citizen, citizenry, but also how do you build uh, a healthier uh, physical place? So kind of the urban form um, and the, the future that was required uh, as places of industry and, and manufacturing and construction how does that phys physical form manifest itself into a healthier community? Um, so cities like uh, Baltimore and Cincinnati and Buffalo uh, here in the States, as well as other uh, cities, I was telling Rachel earlier about uh, German cities that we've started to partner with, like Dortmund and Bottrop and Essen that are hearing of the Glasgow-Pittsburgh uh, partnership and saying, me too, and I want to be a part of that. Um, so we're at the kind of, I think, the, the beginning of something here. I'll turn it over to Lee. Sure. So I, I thought I would take a, a few moments and provide a little bit of context for, uh, for my remarks um, in, in terms of background of the department that I represent. So um, as Allison said before, my, um, my role is director of the Department of Innovation and Performance for the city of Pittsburgh. Um, so that um, encompasses providing technology support for uh, 19 different city departments and 3,200 uh, city employees. Um, we have a mission to elevate the work of city government. So we're obviously not the people that are out inspecting the buildings or repairing the potholes, but we are the department that is supposed to be making those services more efficient and more effective. Um, and we have a pretty large mandate in terms of doing that. So. Uh, we provide everything from basic technology support. We run the city's data center, um, all the telecommunications, end user computing equipment, to all of the engagement channels for the city. So the city's cable bureau, the city's website, et cetera. Um, but I think the other challenge for us is that um, unlike many cities uh, of our size who have a, a separate innovation office um, or a smart cities team, with the city of Pittsburgh, it's all included in my department. So we have a fairly large, um, you know, area of remit that we're supposed to be focused on. Um, and it, it really does create attention for us because there's a lot of break fix issues, as you can imagine, um, that we need to, to focus on. But with smart city technologies, we also need to be forward looking and thinking about how technologies can help those 19 different departments 
and 3,200 employees to um, improve the efficiency of the services that, that are being provided, right? Um, so particularly around smart cities, I think it's the networking um, angle that, that Grant mentioned before that's so helpful to us because we have a very small team because we can't focus solely on um, smart city implementations, it's really important for us to be learning lessons uh, from what's happening in other cities. Um, and so I was really, really happy um, to be invited to participate at the beginning of March, um, which seems like forever ago, um, because in, in uh, the UK, spring was just breaking out. I think the trees were blooming, there were flowers. And six weeks later <laughs> here in Pittsburgh, um, that's, that's barely happening here. Um, As you would recognize, this is a direct day. Yeah. It's it, it's been a it's been a rough winter for us. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, at the beginning of March, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to join um, a delegation that was organized by the British Consulate in Chicago, um, and also the Metro Lab Network. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Metro Lab, it's a collaboration of city and university partners um, that are um, together to try to promote ways that cities and their their universities can collaborate on ways to use the urban environment as a as a test bed for new technologies um, in, in partnership together so uh, here in pittsburgh uh, as an example we work very closely with the university of pittsburgh but also with carnegie mellon university and their metro 21 program and i can talk a little bit more about that later um, but on this particular um, exchange trip to the UK, we visited London, Bristol, and Glasgow. Um, there were, I believe, seven different US cities uh, represented. Um, and we met with a number of different university and government partners um, while in the UK. Just a couple of uh, quick examples and how it was so relevant to the work that we're trying to do here in Pittsburgh. Um, while we were in London, we had the opportunity to meet with an organization called the Future Cities Catapult. Uh, Future Cities Catapult is a network of nine different uh, cent research centers located throughout the UK. Um, their mission is to advance urban innovation, grow UK companies, and improve cities. Um, we had a really, really interesting talk with them. They're, they're working on lots of very uh, practical things, but one of the um, kind of guiding uh, principles that they've been working on with the British Standards Institute is um, establishing a strategy guide for smart cities implementations. So I think with uh, cities, um, we really are challenged. We're kind of at the bleeding edge on implementing some of these technologies. Um, it's a very vendor-led um, discussion, right? So vendors are, are pushing proprietary um, products and services. And I think oftentimes cities rush into agreements with vendors based on all these wonderful promises. And there are these bright, shiny objects out there uh, that people latch on to. So having um, a, a more thoughtful strategy and approach to engaging with those vendors, um, I think, is something really important that we can learn from. So that, that's a, a perfect example. Um, the other um, area, and this is one from Glasgow, um, they have um, a, an initiative called Data Lab in Glasgow that is something that um, is uh, promoted by the Scottish government and is very similar to our efforts here with the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center, which is a partnership between the University of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, um, and the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center is really the region's open data portal. Um, so being able to network with the folks from Data Lab in, in um, Scotland was really important because they're doing some um, really innovative things around fee-for-service models to ensure that that data infrastructure is um, sustainable over time um, and can really be a platform to support evolving data science work uh, for nonprofits, local governments, and research institutions. Um, so the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center here um, is facing a similar challenge. After several years of foundation funding, that is going to decrease at some point. And so the WPRDC is going to look need to look for additional funding sources. So being able to look to Data Lab and some of the things that they've done there is uh, pretty important for us. Um, and then last but not least, uh, you know, since it was such a small group of uh, city participants uh, from the US, we were also able to interact with our um, colleagues from Boulder and Denver and other cities here that are 
encountering the exact same challenges we are. So anytime you have these exchange trips that there aren't a lot of vendors participating in, um, I think you have a lot of real, uh, very productive conversations. Um, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Des um, and he can give his thoughts. We're gonna, Des, just hold on one sec. Yeah. I just wanna let folks know we're gonna hold for questions till everybody's presented something. So go ahead, Des. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Ken. Um, first of all, it's great to be involved in, in this and thank you very much to everyone for, for coming along and, and participating. I've actually managed to see uh, Lee and Grant in, in Glasgow in the last kind of couple of months, I guess. Uh, so Ken, you're, you're letting the side down. You've not you've not been to Glasgow recently, so we need to uh, <laughs> a need whole to find year to, to get you over. So um, I think from our point of view, um, we think of this in terms of learning, but also sharing. So we've got things that we've identified that we really want to learn from, you know, how things are happening in, in, in Pittsburgh, and I'll, I'll come on to that in, in a minute. But we're also keen to share our experience and, and expertise such as it is. Um, that's always user-driven, so in a sense it's for the, the person who's looking for information to decide what things are going to be most relevant to them. But hopefully we've been able to identify some things that we're doing um, that, that are of, of relevance and, and, and interest to, to, to folk in Pittsburgh. And as Grant says, you know, potentially to other people, I think we're in the process of developing a wider network than the two cities. But I think people are quite interested in the fact that we've actually sustained uh, a partnership over a period of time and that there are actually different dimensions of it, which I think is really important. I mean, as Ken said, it started out really uh, with, the, with the, the Robert Johnson uh, grant as um, a specific uh, innovation in the health space, but that built on the connection that we already had uh, in terms of resilience through, through the Rockefeller 100 Cities membership, and we've extended it out to uh, IT through, through the Metrolab connection. So in a sense, there are almost three different legs to, 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 to partnership and, and a, a different group of people involved. What that's done in Glasgow is actually get people to speak to each other. I mean, a lot of us knew each other anyway, but we weren't really speaking about you know, what we were doing as much as we are now doing as a result of the Pittsburgh connection and, and, and getting getting to think seriously about what we're doing and what we can exchange with, with, with others. So I think that's a really, a really important aspect of, of, uh, of this, this partnership. Um, one of the things that I was keen to do when I was involved in Healthy Cities and, and therefore the, the establishment of, uh, or laying the foundations for the establishment of Glasgow Centre for Population Health, Glasgow had been through a long process of thinking of itself as a problem city, as a city with an accumulation of problems, health problems, economic problems, etc. Um, what we've tried to move towards over the last 15 to 20 years is focusing on the idea of Glasgow as a city with lots of opportunities. I mean, yes, we have problems and we acknowledge the, the health deficiencies and the, the consequences of industrial decline. But what we're really focused on is, you know, what are the things that we can actually work with to make Glasgow a better place? And in that process, really think about how we include the whole population of Glasgow in that and, and not move down the, the model where any growth improvement or producti productivity improvements only affect a few people in, in, in the city. And I think we're assisted in that in Glasgow, as I suspect you are in Pittsburgh, by a strong sense of civic identity and civic engagement. People who live in Glasgow really love the city, are very proud of, of, of coming from Glasgow and, and, and being part of a, a city with a distinct character. And that was some, certainly something I picked up in, in Pittsburgh as well. Very strong sense of, of, of local identity, of, of Pittsburghness, um, which, which is expressed in all kinds of ways through the football team, but also in a, a sense of civic pride. Which is, which is really important. People care about what happens to their city, they care about what happens to their neighbours, they care about the city's profile in the national and international environment, and Glasgow is very much the same. We, we, we've got that sense of wanting our city to do, to do well, and that's very widely spread amongst the population. 
What we need to do is actually create narratives around that. So how is it that we actually tell people Glasgow's story, the different things that, that Glasgow is doing, the different opportunities that Glasgow is taking forward. Um, you know, the people of the city, like I guess the people in, in Pittsburgh, um, will only accept uh, stories that make sense. They'll only accept things that actually, um, you know, seem to be doing something, seem to be Im Im improving things. And that's why I think the Centre for Population Health has been successful, because it has told a story about how health can be improved in, in Glasgow and has been able to point to successes. I think with the resilience agenda that Duncan Booker has taken forward in, in Glasgow, we've been able to link the idea of resilience to the idea of civic renewal and building the strength of the city through the strength of its people, building resilience at, at, at local level and using infrastructure investment and, 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 and some of the activities that we're engaging in in, in the city to, to actually make the people of the city um, more capable of surviving the economic stresses and, and, and other stresses that, that Grant, Grant was mentioning. And, you know, we have got a real interest, I think, in, uh, in Metro, 20, Metro Lab and Metro 21. I mean, when I came to Pittsburgh uh, last September, uh, I'd done my research beforehand, and, and one of the things I particularly wanted to do was to meet Rick Stafford, who set up um, Metro Lab in, uh, in, 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 in Pittsburgh, and to find out about you know, what the terrific work was that, that, that seemed to be going on there and why it had been such a role model for other cities across, across, across the US. And that, in a sense, led us then into the engagement with, with Metrolab as a national uh, network. And I think we're looking at uh, taking forward um, some kind of relationship with, with Metrolab at US level, <coughs> Bristol and, and Glasgow as, as, as two UK cities. Uh, who can attach themselves to, to, to Metrolab and, and, and look to that process of exchange of information. So I think this process of kind of um, networking, engagement, discussion of shared problems, trying to learn from each other, being very hard-headed and systematic about how we go about that. You know, we're, we don't want to take everything, but there are particular things we're, we're really interested in that, that you guys do. Um, and you know, thinking about, um, you know, going back to this idea about solutions focused, it's about what works, it's about how we can actually make things better for the city, for the people of the city, and um, really kind of begin to um, get and share technical expertise, but also experience of, of, of governance. And this might be an issue that's particularly of interest to, to some of the people that, uh, at, uh, at the university. Um, I mean, one of the things I've really been interested in, I was in politics, I'm, my background is, is political science, I'm, I'm a sociologist now, but you know, public policy is, is the space that, that I come from. I'm really interested in governance issues and how, uh, in a sense, sometimes poor governance gets in the way of doing of solutions-focused policy. I mean, sometimes institutional structures are just barriers to, 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 to effective work. So how do we get, um, if you like, beyond the picket fence that separates out institutional competences, you know, whether that's city government or you know, county government or state government or federal government? I know, you know, in the, in the US at the minute, you've got a lot of cities that are actually saying on climate change, we're going to take this forward at a city level. We're not going to wait for the federal government to take the initiative or, or, to, or to move us backwards. I mean, I think in, in Scotland and in Glasgow, we've had that as well. We, we don't feel that we can wait for the UK government or the Scottish government to, to give us permission to do things. We've actually got to find things that we can do and put them into effect and, in a sense, wait for them to stop us. So there's a real sense of, of trying to find new ways and new, new ways of innovation in the way in which we think about service delivery, the partnerships we can build up internally within, with, with, within the city, and partnerships outside the city in some ways validate what we do. So we can actually point to the example of Pittsburgh and say, they've done that, they've done a really good job with that, and we could do that. And I guess, you know, hopefully you can actually think of things that we're doing 
that you can seize on and, and, and say these are these are good examples for us to us to take forward. So I think there's a, a kind of a very practical solutions focused way in which we can learn from each other. But there's also a sense in which in, in terms of governance and, and exemplars, we can actually provide models to, for each other. And that promotes a different kind of dialogue, which I think I think is a good thing for everybody. I'll stop Great. that. Thanks. Thanks, Des. Um, I guess um, maybe it would be worthwhile to see if anybody's got any pressing questions or concerns uh, from uh, from what they've heard so far. Is there anybody uh, on the line or uh, uh, at the university who would like to raise an issue or discuss a point uh, in some detail with one of our panelists? Are you guys on mute? Nope. Um, well, I'm going to let you have an opportunity to gestate on that uh, and, and just raise an issue of, uh, that I've been thinking about while I've been listening. I've uh, recently been reading a book uh, called Transatlantic Crossings, um, which is a, a history of um, uh, exchange between uh, particularly cities um, during the uh, progressive era. Uh, essentially 1880 through 1920 up to 1940. And um, it turns out that uh, the exchange between Pittsburgh and Glasgow, for example, is hardly new. Um, <laughs> this was going on back then uh, with uh, particular interest. You're, you mentioned the vendors and the issue of dealing with vendors. They were dealing then with uh, dismantling the vendors of um, of uh, uh, trams and, and uh, transportation, um, which were in most cities privately owned. And Glasgow took the lead as a city in, um, in actually consolidating it and taking over the public so they could run it for, um, for the population rather than profit of the individuals who had it, who, by the way, were incentivized by the structure to have as little transportation as possible so that it was twice as expensive. <laughs> um, so they could, could kind of you know make the drive the costs up or the expense up. Um, so so this um, this book, which I highly recommend, uh, suggests that there's been a reason for us to be in communication for a, a, a long time. Um, both when we were industrializing, I think similar things happen. We're now on uh, at least I think it's 25 years or is it 30 years? It's 30 years since the uh, Remaking Cities conference uh, was sponsored by uh, uh, CMU and uh, David Lewis and folks um, brought together a whole bunch of post-industrial, well, in those days we would have just called them de-industrialized cities, brought them together to Pittsburgh. And, uh, and now I think we're in a new era of exchange. And I wondered if it would be worthwhile to just spend a little bit of time thinking about what this new era actually is. Why, why are we, are we in a new era? What does that mean? What are the challenges? Why are we facing this stuff right now? And why is this timely when 15 years ago, we couldn't have made this happen? I, I can jump in on that. I, I, I think we are in a new era. And, you know, so just you referenced the, the conference of the Remaking Cities Institute, and it's something that um, I think both inspired part of the exchange that we had with Glasgow, but also uh, part of the city's relationships. You mentioned you were in Bristol. Um, when I was in the UK recently, I was also with our colleagues from Manchester. You know, so there's that's kind of that common kinship that that had a shared experience. But I think um, more recently, in 2013, uh, Don Carter is also at Carnegie Mellon and manages the Remaking Cities Institute now hosted the 25th anniversary of, the, of that conference in 2013. Um, and one of the things that, you know, this engagement for us has sparked is the idea of hosting another kind of more intermediate convening sometime in the fall of 2018 here to, to bring together this dialogue um, and, and some of Don's scholarship working with cities, not just Glasgow and Edinburgh, but uh, also places like Rotterdam and Bilbao and Dortmund um, that, that are part of his scholarship. And I think it comes down to two things. One is uh, places that have deindustrialized have experienced that sense of uh, that common sense of loss uh, and loss of industry and the related connections to those industries, but have also experienced a rebirth. 
And the challenge has been is that that rebirth has not been shared by all residents, number one. And number two, we also see on the horizon a, a shift, a technological shift in terms of the advent of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. Um, so almost kind of that economic systemic equilibrium that we've become used to in the last five, 10 years is gonna pivot again. Uh, and one of the things is, is um, from our work in the resilient strategy space, everyone recognized the, you know, the 82, 83 uh, uh, recession and the collapse that went along with it as part of Pittsburgh's historical challenge. But not one resident that we surveyed or engage or working group that we engaged talked about this issue of economic transformation, um, in part because I think we're in the middle of it. Um, and sometimes when you're in the middle of the, the storm, you don't know where you're exactly located. Um, but we, as these cities, have identified that as a common challenge and know some of the roadmaps in order to get us out of it. The challenge is how do we start to accelerate those uh, those learnings to apply them to the challenges that we're facing today. I think there's um, you know just pick up of the points about city narratives. So I mean I think Pittsburgh and Glasgow have both strong city narratives, but one of the things that you learn from media studies is you have to keep telling it all the time before it's kind of you know widespread. So, you know, I think it's really important that, uh, that we constantly replenish our city narrative and tell new stories or additional stories or things that, that buttress the, 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 the city narrative. It's, a, it, it, it's something that doesn't, you know, shouldn't stop. We shouldn't think we've, we've told the story of our, our, our cities. I think we actually need to constantly retell and reinvent the story of the city because in a sense, the economy is constantly changing. And, and the city itself is constantly changing and being reimagined by its by its by its inhabitants. So I think that the, there is a real importance to, to this idea of narrative. Um, that's that that that's, that's one of the dimensions that, because of the particular histories of Glasgow and Pittsburgh, I think we're conscious of. But we're also conscious of it as you know maybe something that that we have to prioritise more than some other cities whose, whose story is being told for, for them. So, so this is something I think that's really important. Any, any comments on that? Because I can keep going if nobody else has anything <laughs> else. Yes, go ahead. I, mean, I, have, a, I have a question uh, which is um, pretty much connected to, to this last comment uh, and also, of course, goes back to the notion of resilience. Um, there is a, an increasing discussion when we talk about global challenges in, in general, and, uh, and then more specific, for example, when we talk about uh, resilience in cities, where the discussion is shifting from a focus on looking for solutions. We are not talking about solutions anymore. We are talking about adaptation uh, in the sense that uh, there are there are really no solutions to very important problems, for example, that have to do with resilience, you know, rising sea levels, for example. Um, we, we are not going to find solutions. What we need is to engage in a process of ad adaptation. This, if you start thinking about that, it's, it's really very, very important in terms of how we do research, how we, uh, um, you know, gather teams, how we approach issues. It's a dynamic process. Uh, so can you comment on that? Is that uh, something that uh, you're talking about in your work? Uh, is uh, what's sort of in your networks? Uh, what's the kind of discussion that is going on if you, you heard that discussion in terms of this shift from solutions to adaptation? You want to take either one of you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably better one for resilience. Sure. So, so a couple, couple ways I would approach that. One is um, the, the the first way I, I would approach it is in conversation around climate. Like you you mentioned sea level rise. You know, one of the the things that we have done is both kind of on the mitigation as well as the adaptation approach. So mitigation, really thinking about 
How do you reduce CO2 levels? How do you uh, incorporate that into the platform of operations of the city? You know, so for example, the way I often talk about it is that Pittsburgh is a, uh, the city of Pittsburgh and our operations, and Lee described this a little bit, is a, a mid-sized firm with 3,000 employees, 1,000 fleet vehicles, and 300 facilities. So how do we incorporate uh, both kind of the ideas of, of energy conservation or climate preparedness in terms of the design of both our fleet as well as our facilities? So if you think about community uh, community facilities or, or, or senior, senior facilities, these are places that we use as uh, of locations of refuge in times of inclement weather, whether it's heat or cold. Um, so we've started to really think about our facilities master planning from that standpoint and what are some of the technologies that then need to be in, deployed in that factor. Um, same thing with regards to uh, take adoption of uh, electric vehicles into our fleet. Uh, so it's not just about buying electric vehicles, but we've also purchased uh, mobile solar canopies that provide zero emissions charging, but also they can be mobilize in a, in a case of an event or emergency to provide backup power resources, uh, you know, on location. Um, so it's that type of thinking that, you know, my team in particular, that we try to engage uh, into the day-to-day decision-making of, of city operations. Um, you know, it's, it's working with Lee's team on issues of, say, cyber threat and cybersecurity and how do we do scenario planning and workshopping to, you know, prepare us for inevitable um, intrusions into our cyber networks, or then also how do we design those cyber networks to make them hardened and adaptable in the face of a, a, a cyber threat. Um, so what resilience has done for us, I think is, and, and just to quickly say that at first when we got into the resilience space, there was pushback from folks that are, you know, in the, the mitigation space, right? Saying that you're, you're giving in or you're giving up if you're dealing with resilience when the fact I think they're really actually kind of, um, you know, compatible uh, thought process, processes in terms of being able to both endure and sustain, but also to be adaptive um, and flexible in the face of adversity. Anybody else want to respond to that? I have actually another another angle on this, which I think came particularly from Glasgow. Glasgow's um, Glasgow's uh, slogan. Do we have a slogan now, really, for the city? Not really. The Go Steelers. Go Steelers. Go Steelers. <laughs> pens. Go Go pens. Pens. Um, Glasgow has a has an actual Before. slogan for the city, which is uh, "People make Glasgow." You'll see this, like you know, there'll be flags hanging around saying people make Glasgow. It'll be in a big building, you know, people make Glasgow. And and then they'll add words to that, like people make Glasgow beautiful, people make Glasgow resilient, people make Glasgow prosperous. Um, and the interesting concept in that, and I think this is really at the heart of, you know, the very simple basic thing that we try to try to get from them is um, this notion that the city builds itself from the bottom up, from the people. And that that when you're talking about adapt being adaptable um, as part of a key element of resilience, because I think you're absolutely correct. Um, there is if we find a solution to one problem, um, you know, it's like a balloon. We're going to have another problem somewhere else, and we're going to have to figure out how to be constantly on our toes and adaptive. Um, and if the people and by this, I mean the people individually, you know, as, as individual people, families and communities, if we are not as capable as we possibly can be, if our communications with each other are not as good as they can be, if our capacity to sit down and puzzle through very significant and difficult challenges are not as good as they need to be, we are going to continually not be resilient. We will always be um, fragmented, and we will be uh, fragile. And I think the um, the kind of the the push here, and you've heard this from Des, and, and you heard it from Grant, and I think Lee as well. That that the idea here that really has fueled things, and and this I don't credit. This is not coming from the the health side. I think this is coming from a recognition of our shared history, 
Um, and that is, we don't want to build a city again that is fragmented as much as it was by, uh, by particularly social class and race and gender, um, because we have lived through that in the past, and we know how that has wasted potential. Mm -hmm. And we know that when the bad times came, they came very hard for certain folks. And we don't want to have that happen again. We want to figure out how to make sure that people are in a position to be adaptable and have their greatest capabilities and capacity so they can thrive. And, um, and I think it's actually our history. It's our Pittsburghness and our Glaswegianness <laughs> or something like that, um, that is, um, is at the core of that. Um, and one of the, I, I, and I'll, I'll stop with this notion. One of the reasons that I was particularly interested in making this link with Glasgow on the health side is because Glasgow really has had a history of acting as though it was concerned about what was happening to all the people in the city, not just to the entrepreneurial class or to the class of folks who are generating all the wealth. Uh, they were really concerned about, you know, we, we really, we, we don't, we're a place of social solidarity and yet our social solidarity has not produced what it needs to produce. We need to figure out how to make it produce more. Um, and I think, you know, Steeler Nation and all, there is a core element of solidarity that exists within this region that makes us a little different than some other places um, and maybe a place to grow something that's a little different than um, has grown uh, in, in other parts of the United States. That's sort of a, an, an ambition perhaps, but it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's my Pittsburgh viewpoint. <laughs> no, I think you're right. And I mean, from a city standpoint, um, the, the mayor likes to say, um, if it's not for all, it's not for us, right? So that was uh, when we did our smart city proposal several years ago to the Department of Transportation, that was kind of one of the core themes in there that as we're rolling out new technologies uh, and thinking about provision of city services that we need to start thinking more equitably across mm -hmm. the entire city. Um, because much as I heard in Glasgow uh, when I was over there, um, we have pockets of, um, you know, where the city is just booming and we have pockets where it's not. Um, and I think that's a common challenge that we definitely face. Um, just as a, a couple of examples, right, we're, we're working right now on a, a project to replace all the city's streetlights. So that will be 40 plus thousand streetlights um, replaced uh, with LED lights, uh, enhanced control, and potential for a data backbone that will uh, support future smart city initiatives. Um, but a core component of that is, as part of this implementation, making sure that there's white equity across the city, because there are certainly areas of the city that don't get their fair share of a, a civic, pretty a basic city service, street lighting. Um, so that, that's one example. Um, and then my department also works on trying to promote digital equity for um, underserved communities. So uh, somebody on my team uh, is working very closely with the housing authority on a project called Connect Home, which is meant to provide um, access to the internet for residents uh, in Pittsburgh public housing communities. So I think those are just a couple of examples um, where we're trying to ensure that inclusion is something that's at the forefront of our minds as we're undertaking these different initiatives. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you know we're doing, and I, I think you're doing as well, which is which is really interesting, is you know really developing the relationship between the university and the city. I mean, I think in 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 the USA, lots of universities you know now see themselves as anchor institutions. They're not going anywhere. They're you know they're part of the city. They 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 know that um, they're big employers. Um, that they have, you know, a big economic effect on the on, on the cities that, that they're situated in. Um, but um, certainly in, in Glasgow, we haven't we haven't really kind of got that relationship, you know, clear in our heads. So, you know, and it was only really when we started to think about um, the campus redevelopment that we're we're doing. I mean, we, we've. We've been very fortunate in Glasgow that uh, kind of reconfiguration of, of health services has actually meant a hospital site has actually been vacated immediately next to the university. So that gives us a huge development of opportunity. 
uh, on our on our existing site, which is which is very unusual or adjacent to our existing site. So we're reconfiguring the campus and, and building new bits. But part of my job is to actually think, well, how does that have effect in the city as a whole? You know, in the in the in in, in the activities that are around the, the redevelopment, but then looking beyond that to, to what kind of effect that the university's economic uh, activity can actually have for the different strands of things we're interested in, like the health of the city, like resilience of the city, like the economy of the city looking ahead. I mean, what input do we have to the governance process of the city? You know, do we have some kind of catalytic role in bringing business together with, with governmental institutions and other, other, other partners? And it's a really interesting set of issues. And over the next kind of month, I'm going to be um, hosting, you know, I think three events. We've already had a workshop on how we take this forward, but we're holding three kind of sectoral events. You know, bringing together people from different strands of, of activity within the city and saying, right, we're doing this. You know, how can we partner with you? You know, what kinds of things are you doing that fit in with what we're doing that can actually bring benefits to the city? And that's really kind of made the city sit up and think, hey, these guys are really important for us. You know, which I'm not saying they didn't think that before, but they're really thinking about it now and thinking about it in different kinds of ways. And, you know, inviting us into uh, the presentations that they're making for their purposes about, you know, what they want to do with the city. So I think there's been a real kind of um, uh, watershed moment for us in Glasgow at the university about how we contribute to the city, but also in the city about about how they wish to engage with us and the kinds of different kinds of partnerships that, that we can have. And there are huge opportunities. I mean, MetroLab is a fantastic example of you know, the skills and capabilities at the university being used for the, the advantage of, 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 of the city. And it's not rocket science. It's relatively simple stuff, actually. Um, you know, it's the, the expertise exists, the need exists, and what you need to find is a mechanism of bringing these, these two things these two things together. And there are other areas where that can happen. I mean, you know, basically um, acute care and, and having the best doctors in the world, which we, we have a lot of, you know, medical expertise at, at, in, in Glasgow, actually hasn't delivered improved health for the citizens. And, and the reason for that is that, you know, treating people when they're ill very well doesn't actually you know, lead to, lead, lead to significant improvements in health. You know, that, that's about better employment, it's about better education, it's about improving housing. There's a whole range of, of, of different things uh, where the city, in a sense, holds the ring. So if we want to show impact as a, as a university, then we have to engage out of the silos that we've traditionally engaged in, the academic discipline silos, the, the faculty silos, and begin to think about how the different strands of expertise that we've got can actually contribute to, 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 to the city. And doing that involves building relationships over a sustained period and coordinating that a bit better than we, we've been able to do in, in the past. So I think you know, some of these things that, that, are, that are beginning to happen now um, are because you know, we're looking at the opportunities, but also because we're looking at the examples of what other people do. And you know the kinds of things that, that, that you've been doing with with with, uh, with the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon has actually inspired us to, to to think in a different way about what we might be able to do with the expertise that we've got in our partnership with the city. So I think this this whole idea of city university partnerships is a really fertile area for for, for advancing. And of course, you know, in a sense, universities have their own systems of exchange of ideas and their own kind of Freemasonry of, of, of the way thing, things are done. It's different from the way in which cities do things, but actually we can piggyback on each other. And that's a really important dimension of, of, of partnership, you know, making sure that the partnership spreads rather than it's just a, a kind of one-to-one -one thing. Actually, yes. I have a question that kind of builds on that, so I'll take this opportunity. Thanks, Des, for setting it up. Speaking as someone who works at um, what I notice is there are these opportunities that have been formalized for partnership, but that there's a ton of potential still there. And it's hard because while universities do have the capacity to add all this research and expertise, universities, at least 
my experience, are not perfect systems where someone at the top can tell you everything that's happening. They're diffuse, right? And the individuals do research, and it's very often very compartmentalized and siloed. Um, and you know, we've seen it in terms of city networks. You know, we have researchers doing a lot of the same kind of work, but on different cities. You know, I mean, I know the European cases because we do European studies. But you know, in addition to Glasgow um, and some other cities that have been mentioned, I know people doing work on Lyon in France, and we just recently came back from a visit with the Chancellor to Lyon on some new capital um, in the UK. And again, there are those potentialities there. There are researchers connected through grants to do all this work. So I guess my question, there is one there, is are there ways in which we could provide forum to identify those moments? Because there's a lot of mutual opportunity there. You know, universities have expertise, but we also are looking for experiences for undergraduates to do original research. We're looking for internships, we're looking for opportunities to help our students, and the city could be using, you know, to generate ideas. So I want, and, and there's probably no answer right now, but are there ideas for how to better identify those or create forum to discuss these possibilities and to make more, you know, reality some of these potentialities? So um, I actually serve as the, the representative on the city side for the Metro, Metro 21 initiative with uh, CMU. Um, and I think, you know, we, we certainly, I, I totally understand where you're coming from because I mean, CMU has lots of different schools, many different researchers in different areas. Um, and the city has a lot, a lot of different needs on our side, right? So it is a little bit of a matchmaker situation. Um, so it, not that it's perfect, but what we've kind of settled on is that there's a, um, executive director of the Metro 21 program on the Carnegie Mellon side that really serves as the point of contact for working with the city. So they do um, kind of an annual call for proposals um, where they'll have researchers approach them and say, you know, we would love to be able to be paired up with this part of the city mm -hmm. to research this particular problem. Um, that gives us an opportunity to say whether there's a match on our side. Um, because there's certainly a capacity issue for us, right? If the if Carnegie Mellon comes to us with 10 different great ideas, we'd love to take all of them, but we just don't have the capacity to do it. So um, like kind of jointly, we work on the priorities and that's how we've done the matchmaking. Um, and it's also been a good forum to identify research projects uh, with student groups. Um, uh, but again, it's not perfect, right? Um, but it, I think it has been fairly successful so far. And I, I would just add, um, you know, similar to that, we've had numerous, I mean, including this one, numerous connections you know, from my, my work in department on uh, with the University of Pittsburgh. So whether it's from the Center for Energy and the work that we've done around district energy and microgrids or the Congress of Neighboring Communities and the work that we've developed with um, sewer regionalization, um, or even doing tabletop exercises and blowing up the city county building with Dean Burke from the School of Public Health. Um, true story. Um, it, it, it requires more explanation. Um, but, but the idea of, of kind of using research as a tool to both improve performance. The other thing, and, and just to build a little bit off of what Des is saying, and, and, and maybe as advocates within the university, um, the the idea of uh, for the city planning department we oversee the institutional master planning process so every 10 years the colleges hospitals and institutions of the cities have to go through a master planning process and Pitt is going through that right now um, so in terms of both uh, as you think about the performance of your buildings or how transportation systems work or where the next office complex might be located um, thinking of yourself as consumers um, of those services is really important. Um, and, you know, when you think about kind of what Des is undertaking uh, in terms of an innovation campus, you know, Pitt is at the epicenter in Carnegie Mellon and Chatham and Carlo as well. Um, you know, so we've, we've had a lot of those conversations, but it could beg the question of finding ways in which to drill down um, a little bit deeper could create some more opportunity. I want to jump in as well just to, to throw out this. We have right now a raging uh, epidemic of uh, opiate 
use and, and death. Um, it's not uh, less less recognized, but and not quite as dramatic in its growth has been an uh, epidemic of increasing suicide. Um, we have uh, increasing alcohol use and other drugs, and we've just got some uh, lots and lots of trauma and bad stuff that's happening on a day to day basis out there. Um, and it's regionalized. There is some evidence that the Rust Belt and coal country in particular, which are our bread and butter, um, are really a big deal. Um, but we don't have a network. There has not been a network created to address this in any kind of coherent way. And I think one of the reasons, and, and I, I just want to reflect on Pittsburgh and maybe Glasgow too, um, when we were on the up and up and up and you know up and coming in the 1880s and 90s and whatever, there was a lot of exchange going on. People were looking for new ideas. What happens, I think, when you go through that process of loss that Grant was describing, is that people um, in a city often sort of hunker down. Mm -hmm. And we've mm -hmm. had the benefit of having a little bit of help looking out. So the university I think has actually been a part of that, um, so that we can see some other stuff in the world. But I think places like um, places like Akron, Steubenville, um, all down the Ohio River Valley, <laughs> stuff that's all in our region as part of who we actually are, are um, are much more isolated and, and disconnected. Um, and uh, we um, we have an opportunity, I think, to become a node for a network that would be about this greater Atlantic economy, because it's the same thing in Glasgow and its hinterlands, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that we could actually begin to think about how to find the solutions and the adaptations that we need to move into another, another world, right? Glasgow actually has some evidence, and, and, and Des, this is to your credit, I just heard Michael Marmot talk about Glasgow, which they always do. If anybody talks about health inequalities or inequities, they always mention Glasgow. It's, it's, it's one of the places you have to stop in any conversation. And they say, Glasgow has atrocious health inequities. Um, and, uh, and then they'll say, Michael Marmot just said, and there's evidence that they are improving, that there's actually a narrowing of the gap, and that some of the activities during the new labor uh, enterprise actually had made some difference in the health and well-being. And we know that the suicide rate in Glasgow, instead of going up like ours has been, has actually been tending down. So there's various, and they contain, they've had, have, they had their hair explosion years ago and they've contained it. Um, so there's things that we can learn from these places. There's a network that's out there, but I think we have to really work at wanting to make it happen. That's why I think the work that Grant has been involved with is, um, is so key. We are we are a new city essentially, and we have to figure out how to be a new city. And the best place to do that is going to be in partnership with places that are also trying to become new cities. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I worked a lot with people in New York and London and uh, Paris, and they all get together all the time, talk about what great cities they are. You know, we're the great cities of the world. And then you say, well, Pittsburgh's just not quite like that. <laughs> We have other issues. And then you try to find the people in the world who are going to have similar issues. And that is, I think, a, a, a fountain of, uh, of opportunity. I think, too, like fostering those, you know, exchanges like this. I mean, you mentioned Lyon. Uh, you know, we have this week uh, La Fabrique de la Cité is here um, from France. Um, we have the P4 conference. Uh, so, like, we're starting to make those networks. And I think in terms of, like, fitting together, both the people as well as the scholarship that helps tell those stories um, is really fertile ground. And, you know, to build off what Kevin was saying, it's a strong place for the University of Pittsburgh, I think, to play. Um, you know, we're, we would love to partner and, and help him to facilitate that. You know, to add to that, I mean, if, it, it seems to me that the university prospers if Pittsburgh prospers. And if the region prospers, the university prospers. Um, and if the university doesn't prosper, then Pittsburgh won't. Um, so we, we've got to figure out a racial relationship between the region and and um, and the universities in particular. Yeah, I think one of the things that I mean, yeah, Pittsburgh is a is a city with great universities. Um, you know, I think the universities, you know, in, in Glasgow is, is 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 in the top 100. Um, so it's a big asset for for our city. And you know the evidence is that you know there is a alignment with city prosperity and and university quality uh, that that is is partly about innovation, but it's also about um, 
<clears throat> the economic weight, so the, uni the university, if it is successful, you know, adds to the, the economic prosperity of, of the city. So there's an innovation effect and there's an economic effect. And the two, the two work together. One of the things that I think you know, we're very conscious of in, in Glasgow and, and I guess other cities in, in the UK at the minute, <clears throat> in the university sector, I mean, almost nobody in working in a university was in favour of Brexit. So, you know, we view this as a, a major threat to, to, to our sector, but also to our, our country. Um, but, you know, the dynamics of, of politics are such that it, it, it looks like that, that may be our, our destination. So that's making us rethink, in a sense, what we can do as a city, what we should be doing as a university to offset some of the negative impacts of, 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 of this. And partly that you know, involves us really thinking hard about networks and, and the kind of networks we want to have and what position we want to be in terms of our connection with, with people in, in, in the world. Um, and in a kind of paradoxical way, um, you know, it's making us think differently about and, and, and much more actively about the kind of networks we should be having with colleagues in the USA uh, and places like Australia and, and Canada. Um, which is not to say that we want to abandon our, our networks with, with, with European colleagues in, in universities or in cities. We're actually keen to build them up as well. But I think the whole kind of thrust of, of what we need to do is to, to really think about you know, the world is not there for us. It's not going to be sort of taken in a direction that we want to by the direction that our, our nation seems to be going. So what do we do as a city or as a university to, to offset that? And how, how can we, by being more proactive in this net, networking and learning space, um, kind of secure a future for ourselves that, that, that we think is, is very important in, in the circumstances that we, we, we unfortunately face? So we're looking for friends and colleagues and <laughs> mentors and, 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 and people to cooperate with on, you know, a kind of um, a pragmatic uh, basis, you know, to say, look, you know, we're still here, we're still doing good stuff, you know, our city's still going to be there, our university's still, you know, got the same people in it. So how do we make the best of, of, of these, these kinds of circumstances? And one of the tests, I suppose, will be how resilient we can be in the, in the, in the context of this significant political change that, that's, that's kind of looming over the horizon. That's a good comment, uh, Des, to maybe come to a close on and uh, just note that I think that one of the key uh, kind of key um, uh, elements of resilience is is a network, and being connected into networks um, is something that will uh, likely lead to greater resilience because you obviously have greater flows of information, greater flows of uh, resource, greater flows of opportunity, and um, um, hopefully this conversation today has been a, a useful discussion about um, what what the uh, the utility and opportunities are in the connection that's emerged between Pittsburgh and Glasgow at this point in time and where things might go for future work um, with other cities and, uh, and uh, but but always with Glasgow and Pittsburgh as the keynote first among equals that's it and I think we can stop at that point because we are Time. Well, thank you very much to you, Ken, and to all of our panelists, um, and thanks to you, all of you for joining us. Um, have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah.